All right, welcome back. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if we have a definite integral from a to b of some function times dx, that's going to be equal to the antiderivative capital F of that function evaluated at the upper bound b minus the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound a of our definite integral. And so in this case, if we look at this example here, we have the definite integral from zero to two of the function eight x. And so if we wanna solve this, we'll start by finding the antiderivative of this function eight x. So this will be equal to eight times x to the power of one plus one divided by one plus one. And we're going to be evaluating this from zero to two. That is all that this notation here means. And so in this case, we used the power rule for integration on our function eight x. And so we added one to our exponent of x. So we have one plus one and then divided by that new exponent. So we have one plus one in the denominator. And so one plus one is two. And so eight divided by two is four. So this is going to be equal to four times x to the power of one plus one, which is two, so x squared. And that's still going to be evaluated from zero to two. And so if we use the fundamental theorem of calculus here, this will be equal to this antiderivative of this function evaluated at two minus the evaluation of this antiderivative at zero. So we're gonna have four times two squared minus four times zero squared. And so two squared is four, so we'll have four times four here, that will be 16, and then minus four times zero squared. And zero squared is zero, and so zero times four is zero, and so we're just subtracting zero. And so this will be equal to 16 minus zero, which is just equal to 16. And that is the answer to this definite integral. And so then how about our second example here, where we have the integral from negative one to zero of three x squared minus two times dx. Well, let's start by integrating this function here, and this will be equal to three times x to the power of two plus one divided by two plus one minus two x. And that will still be evaluated from negative one to zero. Right, so we use the power rule on our first term here. We added one to our exponent for x squared and then divided by that new exponent. So we have x to the power of two plus one divided by two plus one. And then when you take the integral of a constant, you just multiply it by x or whatever the variable of integration is. And in this case, we're integrating with respect to x, that's what dx means. And so we're multiplying by just x. And so if we simplify, this will be equal to three divided by two plus one, that's going to be three. So this three and this three will cancel out and we'll just be left with x to the power of two plus one, which is x cubed and then minus two x, and that will still be evaluated from negative one to zero. And so if we evaluate this, we have to plug zero into our antiderivative here, and so we're going to have zero cubed minus two times zero, and now we're going to subtract negative one plug into our antiderivative. And so we'll have negative one cubed minus two times negative one. And so if we simplify this, we'll have zero cubed is zero minus two times zero, which is zero. And so this first part is just going to be zero. So this will be equal to zero minus negative one cubed. That's going to be negative one. And then we have negative two times negative one. And so that's going to be positive two. And so we have negative one plus two, which is positive one. And then we have this negative that's going to affect that. And so our answer here is that it is equal to negative one. Okay, and so those were two basic examples of evaluating definite integrals using what we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus, but there is a second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus that we wanna look at as well. All right, so the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from the lower bound a to the upper bound x of some function defined with t dt will be equal to f of x. And so for this example right here, we wanna find what this is equal to. We wanna find small f of x. And so if you wanted the quick answer for this example, you could just plug this upper bound x into this function and you would find that f of x is equal to the square root of x, but sometimes that's not going to work depending on what your bounds are. And so instead of going through that quick method, we are going to show our work here to see how we get that answer of the square root of x. And so let's start by defining that f of t is equal to the square root of t. And so if we say that, then we'll have that our problem is equal to the derivative d dx of the integral from zero to x of f of t dt. 
And so then if we go through with the integral here, this will be equal to d dx or the derivative of the antiderivative of our function evaluated from zero to x. And so then if we plug in x and zero into our antiderivative, this will be equal to the derivative of capital F of x minus capital F of zero. And so if we take the derivative of each of these terms, the derivative of f of zero is going to be zero because f of zero is just a constant, right? This is not defined with x in any way, and so it's just a constant, meaning that the derivative will be zero. And so we don't need to worry about that term, but what would be the derivative of the antiderivative capital F of x? Well, that would be equal to the original function f of x, right? If we integrate a function, we find the antiderivative, capital F of x, and so if we take the derivative of that antiderivative, we get back that function, small f of x. All right, and so now that we found that the derivative of these two terms is just equal to f of x, we can then plug x into our function over here, f of t, and find the answer to this problem. And so that means that f of x will be equal to plugging x into the square root of t, so we will have the square root of x. And so that would be the answer to this problem here. And so while you could skip all this work by just plugging this value of x in our upper bound there into this function, the square root of t, to get the square root of x, that's not always going to work in the future. So it's good to show this work so that you make sure that you do have the right answer. And so let's look at another example of using the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so for our next example, we have the derivative with respect to x of the integral from four to negative x of t cubed dt. And so just like we did with our last problem, let's start by setting our integrand or what is inside our integral, the function here, t cubed, equal to f of t. So we're gonna have that f of t is equal to t cubed. And so if we rewrite our problem, we'll have that this is equal to the derivative of the integral from four to negative x of f of t dt, and now we can take the integral of this function, and this will be equal to d dx of the antiderivative of that function evaluated from four to negative x. And so now if we plug in each of these bounds into our antiderivative here, our next step will be that this is equal to the derivative of the antiderivative evaluated at negative x minus the antiderivative evaluated at four. All right, and so then our next step is going to be to take the derivative of each of these terms. But now notice that something is going to be a little bit different this time. We're gonna be taking the derivative of the antiderivative of negative x. And so what exactly is different here that is going to make this problem slightly more difficult? Well, we're actually going to need to use the chain rule to take the derivative of this term right here, right? We have an outside function, the antiderivative, and an inside function of negative x. In fact, we had that before, right? When we took the derivative of the antiderivative and that inside function was just x, we technically were using the chain rule, but we didn't really worry about multiplying by the derivative of the inside function because a derivative of x is just one, right? So this would have been equal to small f of x times one, right? We took the derivative of the outside function the derivative of the antiderivative is that small f of x, and then we multiply by the derivative of the inside function, which is x, and the derivative of x is one. And so in this case, for negative x, we are going to be multiplying by the derivative of negative x, which is going to be negative one. And so that means that this will be equal to the derivative of this outside function, so we're gonna have small f of negative x times the derivative of the inside function, which is going to be negative one, and then the derivative of capital F of four is just going to be zero because this is a constant, right? We're just plugging four into the antiderivative. So it's just one big constant that we are going to differentiate and get zero. And so we'll have minus zero. But if we simplify this, this will be equal to negative small f of negative x. And so to find the answer for this specific problem, we are going to have to plug negative x into our function here, f of t, and then negate it because of this negative right here. And so we will have that this is equal to negative, negative x cubed, right? We plug negative x into t for this function. So we have negative x cubed 
and we are negating that function. All right, and so then you could keep it in this form if you wanted to, but we can actually simplify this a little bit. It might not be initially obvious, but we can rewrite this to be equal to negative, negative one cubed times x cubed, right? We have negative one times x on the inside here. And so if we cube each part, we'd have negative one cubed and x cubed. And we know that negative one cubed is negative one. So this would be equal to negative, negative one times x cubed. And so then negative, negative one would be positive one. And so this is just going to cancel out. And so our final answer is x cubed. And that would be the answer to this problem. All right, and so let's look at another example. All right, so for our next example, we have the derivative of the integral from one to x cubed of the cubed root of t dt. And so once again, let's start off by setting our integrand or our function inside the integral equal to f of t. And so we'll have that f of t is equal to the cubed root of t. And so then if we rewrite our problem, we'll have that this is equal to the derivative of the integral from one to x cubed of f of t dt. And so then we are able to integrate this function and this will be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative of our function evaluated from one to x cubed. And so then if we were to go through and evaluate this function for x cubed and one, this would be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative evaluated at x cubed minus the antiderivative evaluated at one. And so if we take the derivative of each of these terms, that would be our next step. The derivative of this term is going to require the chain rule, just like our previous example. We have the outside function of the antiderivative and an inside function of x cubed. And so this will be equal to the derivative of the outside function. So we're gonna have small f of x cubed, right? The inside part of that function does not change, but then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. And so the derivative of x cubed is three x squared, right? We multiply three down and then subtract one from our exponent. So we have three x squared. And then a derivative of the antiderivative evaluated at one is just going to be zero because once again, this is a constant. And so the derivative of a constant is zero. So we have minus zero. And so that is equal to three x squared times the function evaluated at x cubed. And so to find the final answer, we just have to plug x cubed into this function up here, f of t, and that will be f of x cubed. And so if we do that, we will have that this is equal to three x squared times the cubed root of x cubed, right? We plugged x cubed into this function, so we have the cubed root of x cubed. And so now the cube root of a cubed number is just going to be that number, right? And so this is just going to be equal to x. This cubed root and this cube will cancel out. And so this will be equal to three x squared times x, which would then be equal to three x cubed. And so that would be the final answer to this problem. And so notice that if you were to use that method where you just plug in your upper bound into that function on the inside of your integral, you would not get this answer. You would just get x, which would be incorrect because you're not multiplying by the derivative of that bound, three x squared. And so if you wanted to, you could even come up with an even better trick to do this process a lot more quicker if you weren't interested in showing the work. And that is that you could just plug this upper bound, x cubed, into your function and then multiply by the bounds derivative. And that would get you the same answer. But again, that's only if you're not interested in showing all this work, which I always recommend you do if you can. All right, and so let's look at another example. All right, so for our next example, we have the derivative of the integral from two to sine x of the square root of t plus t to the fourth power dt. And so in this case, once again, let's just set our integrand or the function inside our integral equal to f of t. So we'll have f of t is equal to the square root of t plus t to the fourth power. And so then if we rewrite our problem, this will be equal to the derivative of the integral from two to sine x of the function f of t dt. And so then we can integrate this function and this will be equal to d dx or the derivative of the antiderivative capital F of t evaluated from two to sine x. All right, and so then if we evaluate this antiderivative for sine x and two, our next step will be that we will have the derivative or d dx of the antiderivative capital F of sine x 
minus capital F of 2. And so in this case, once again, we're going to need to use the chain rule to evaluate this part of our derivative. Our outside function is the antiderivative, or capital F, and our inside function is sine x. And so in this case, our derivative will be equal to small f of sine x times the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of sine x is cosine x. So we'll be multiplying by cosine x. And then the derivative of capital F of 2, once again, this is a constant, so the derivative is just 0. So we'll subtract 0. And so that means that this is equal to F of sine x times cosine x. And so to figure out what this is equal to, we need to plug sine x into our function up here, F of t. And so if we do that, our answer will be equal to that cosine x times sine x plugged into our function here. So we will have the square root of sine x plus sine to the fourth power x. And so this would be the final answer to this problem. So once again, if you wanted a quick method, you could just plug sine x into each t in this integrand and then multiply by the derivative of the bound, cosine x. And so let's look at one more final example for this video. All right, so for our last example, we have the derivative of the integral from x squared to x to the fourth power of the square root of t plus one dt. And so let's start this problem like we did with the other ones. Let's set our function inside the integral equal to f of t. So we'll have f of t is equal to the square root of t plus one. And so then if we rewrite our problem, this will be equal to the derivative of the integral from x squared to x to the fourth power of the function f of t dt. And so then we'll integrate this function. And so this will be equal to the derivative of the antiderivative capital F of t, evaluated from x squared to x to the fourth power. And so now we're finally getting to the somewhat tricky part, but it's not going to be too bad if you've been following along with our previous examples. We'll start by evaluating our antiderivative on x to the fourth power and x squared. And so we'll have that this is equal to the derivative, or ddx, of capital F of x to the fourth power minus capital F of x to the second power, or x squared. And so now, instead of having one throwaway term where the derivative was just zero because it was a constant, we now actually have two functions here that are going to require the chain rule to take the derivative of. And so let's start with our first term, and then we'll move into our second term. And so this will be equal to the derivative of the outside function, which is going to be the antiderivative here. So we're going to have small f of x to the fourth power, right? We do not change that inside function but then we're going to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. And the derivative of x to the fourth power is going to be four x cubed, right? We multiply by our exponent and then subtract one from that exponent, so we have four x cubed. And then we're going to subtract the derivative of this term. And so we'll start by taking the derivative of the outside function once again. And so we're going to have small f of x squared, right? We don't change that inside function, but then we're going to multiply by the derivative of x squared. And so if we multiply by the derivative of x squared, that derivative is 2x, right? We multiply by our exponent of 2 and then subtract 1 from the exponent, so we have just 2x. And so in order to figure out what this is equal to, we have to plug x to the fourth power into this function for this part of our answer. And then we need to plug x squared into our function to find this part of our answer. And so this will be equal to 4x cubed times x to the fourth power plugged into our function up here. So we're gonna have the square root of x to the fourth power plus one. And then we're going to subtract two x times x squared plugged into this function. So then we will have the square root of x squared plus one. And so that would make this the final answer to this problem. And so if you wanted to know the quick way to find this answer without going through all this work, all you would have to do is plug in your upper bound into this function and then multiply it by the derivative of that bound. So that would get you this term and then subtract the lower bound plugged into this function. So you'd have this part right here and then you would multiply by the derivative of that lower bound. So you'd have two X times what you found from plugging it in to that function. And so that would be the quick way to find this answer. But of course, like I said, it's always better to show your work so you can see how to get that answer. All right, and so that was the last example for this video. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.